Good afternoon, welcome or welcome back to the series HSI International Mexican Students at the UA. Um, the University of Arizona is located in a place where many peoples and cultures intersect. And we'd like to start by respectfully acknowledging our presence on ancestral indigenous lands. And in particular, we would like to honor the Tohono O'odham Nation and the Pascuayaki Nation. Here at the OA, we feel that is an institutional responsibility to recognize and to acknowledge the people, culture, and history that make up our Wildcat community. And this series is part of our efforts to broaden awareness throughout campus to ensure our diverse students, faculty, and staff feel represented and valued. My name is Masha Jamin, and I work as an instructor, coordinator, and educational developer in the UA's Teaching Center, the Office of Instruction and Assessment. And I've had the pleasure to prepare this series with my colleague Nadia Alvarez Mejia, who moderated our first session on Monday when we talked about navigating the different higher education systems. So Nadia, would you share a few takeaways from our session on Monday? Thank you, Masha. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. My name is Nadia Alvarez Mejia. I work as the director of Mexico programs, and also I have a faculty affiliation in the College of Education. In our Monday webinar, we learn from the students, alumni, and colleagues on campus about diversity in the Mexican culture and how this culture plays a significant role in an influence to students in academia. Also, we discuss the importance of creating an inclusive environment on campus where different accents and cultural perspectives are welcomed as a pathway to share ideas, perspectives, and create knowledge. Masha? We received great news today. We would like to congratulate the university to being awarded with a member distinction by HACU, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. So special acknowledgement to Dr. Malo Franco for her leadership and the HSI initiatives team and all campus members who contribute to our HSI efforts. So today's session is entitled Intercultural Communication and Learning in the Classroom. And after looking at the challenges of navigating educational systems and the benefits of student support services, we now want to take a closer look at what happens in the classrooms. We have one introductory speaker and three panelists, which leaves us much time for question and answers today. Today, uh, Masha will be our main moderator and will be responsible for, uh, I'll be responsible for timekeeping and monitoring the chat with the help of Monique too from HSI Initiatives Office. We'll invite the first panelists to share their expertise for five minutes the same will repeat for every other panelist. I will post the panelist bios in the chat as each of them is introduced. We have also posted their bios on the website uh, of the HSI initiatives. And after that, we will open the session for questions, answers, and comments. For all of you in the audience, please know that you are welcome to start posting questions in the chat at any time. But please understand that we won't address them until every panelist has had the opportunity to speak. I will do my best to keep track on your questions and to make sure they will be addressed. Masha, the mic is yours. So I would like to start our conversation on intercultural learning by welcoming Dr. Lisa Elfring to share some opening remarks. Dr. Elfring is the Associate Vice Provost for Instruction and Assessment and leads the efforts of our teaching center in providing instructional support for anyone who is teaching here at the UA. Welcome, Dr. Elfring. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and I'm very excited about this series. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Um, I've led the Office of Instruction and Assessment on our campus for about four years, but I have many, many more years of experience on our campus where I'm an instructor in molecular and cellular biology. And although I've taught many kinds of classes over the years, um, I tended to specialize in some of the most difficult courses for students, very large enrollment introductory science classes. Um, 
I am still here after all these years because I learned so much from students in those classes. The biggest thing that I've learned is that teaching is really not about the content that you are trying to share and how, help students learn. It's about the relationships that you have with students. You have to be able to pull on that relationship in order to create a, a meaningful learning environment. And you can't do that if you don't understand the students. So over the years, I've taught probably thousands of students and hundreds of international students. And um, I have learned so much that the things that are in the syllabus are not the most important ways that I have to interact with the students. Things like the language I use, the way I dress when I'm teaching, the examples I use, the pronouns that I ask students for or not are all important in creating an environment that supports learning. And that's in the classroom, but there's a lot of learning that happens outside the classroom too. Um, wonderfully at our institution, we have a very rich tradition of having both undergraduate and graduate students in, involved in research and applied settings. Um, and in those situations, the opportunities for learning are often better because the groups are smaller, the interactions tend to be one-on-one, -on -one, and the instructor can come to understand the students better and the students can understand the instructor better. Um, there's a common sharing of their histories, their cultures, what their hopes and dreams are, and um, why they're interested in what they're working on. So this summer, um, I was part of a group reading a book called Radical Hope, a Teaching Manifesto by Kevin Bannon. Um, and this book about education, um, in that book, Kevin Bannon talks a lot about what he calls the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is the things that we communicate to students outside of the explicit curriculum that we've planned. So some examples of that are, for example, in a large introductory class, when I was a student, obviously many years ago, it was very common for the instructors to say on the first day of class, look to your right, look to your left. By the end of the course, only one of you will remain. We can all probably appreciate that that is a terrible way to begin any sort of a relationship because it's begin telling students that at the very beginning, you're expecting two thirds of them to fail. So that's probably an extreme example. And honestly, I don't know that anyone would do that anymore. I certainly hope not. But we still need to be uh, conscious of the hidden curriculum. We need to be conscious about whether we're telling students the things that really matter for them to be successful now and to be successful in the future. And even if we are telling them, are we doing so in a way that connects with our prior experiences and in a way that's sensitive to their background and the needs that they have at the current time? So as instructors, we can always all do better. We can be aware of the power structures and the other kinds of structures that are present in our institution. And um, the impact of even the most casual decisions we make. So I come to this group today humbly as a learner, as an instructor who wants to do better for my students. Um, and I am really looking forward to hearing what the panelists have to share. And thank you again for the invitation. Thank you so much, Dr. Alfrey. And uh, you, you've laid out very clearly that in order to learn about and support learning at intercultural intersections, it's paramount to listen to our students. So our first panelist today is a student and I welcome Ms. Alma Tejera Patron, who is a doctoral student in psychology and a member of the UA International Student Advisory Council. And we've invited her to share some experiences about navigating the different roles and relationships with instructors or advisors or peers. So take it away, um, take it away Alma. We're looking forward to hear from your experience. Uh, 
Thank you, and thank you for everybody to be here. Really, I I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, and I think that I could not be more agree with everything that you have said uh, so far because I feel that some sometimes we can forget or, or, maybe, or maybe we can more than forget like focus like on the academic part what what is the content but I think before of that we should like address some some issues that maybe are equally or, or if not more important than, than that. So I think this, uh, this, is, a, it, this is a good, good opportunity to share that. Um, specifically, two things that I would like to, to share today, like um, to, to maybe help uh, a little uh, sharing uh, how, uh, what are like the, the main difference between the roles uh, of instructors and students, like uh, comparing Mexico and the US. Um, a little background uh, about me, I'm from Mexico, but I'm not from North Mexico. I, usually there is, a, a, I have seen that here in the, in the U of A, a lot of students are from Sonora and Sonora is very North uh, Mexico. So one way or another, they are more used to the US system, uh, we could say. In my case, it's like totally the opposite. I'm from the South. Uh, I didn't know anything uh, coming coming here. And I, I feel that I, um, yeah, maybe I, I can share a, a little a different perspective, but maybe not so, uh, so different. Well, we will see. Uh, in Mexico overall, uh, the student-teacher relationship are more hierarchical. Um, usually the professor is, is like, seen as an expert. He, he knows everything, he's the expert. And a student is more a passive consumer of, of knowledge. Um, I, here in the United States, uh, I, I feel that it's, uh, professor are more seen like a facilitator and the student is more like an active or is expected the student is more like active producer of knowledge. So I think, so I think that is one of the main uh, cultural difference. In Mexico, there is a high power a distance between student and professors. However, I could say also that for some um, students or in some context, that, that is kind of changing. There is a lot of variability. Overall, that is that status situation. But maybe uh, for younger students like 20 year old, 18 year old, they they are more used or it's more it's easier to them like to to have more equal relationship with their professor. I suppose sometimes somebody that maybe has 30 year old, 40 year olds or 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 more that they are more used to have that power is a structure. Also, if somebody, a student come from a big city for Mexico City, for example, or, or Monterrey, uh, maybe they are more, they will be more used to have an egalitarian relationship as opposed to somebody who uh, maybe comes from a small town. But um, again, the status uh, re uh, relationship exists, but it can, bar it can vary depending where a you confront. I will say that the, the relationship or the education is a little more professor center as opposed to uh, student center. So uh, the strongest <laughs> will survive, we could say the best professor are like the one that is like very strict and gives you a lot of homework to do and very tough e exams. And that maybe uh, is from my point of view not necessarily is inclusive something that i i like from here the american way it could be more inclusive because you are uh, you are trying as an instructor to to be um, inclusive with a, a, every student i try to to be more a student center as opposed to professor center so i i would say that that is like the, the main uh, difference between academic systems that I can uh, perceive. Um, another uh, thing that, that from, from my experience, I, I feel it's, it's, it will be important to share is that what are the biases or misunderstandings that sometimes happen between students from Mexico uh, and instructors and, and peers? And peers, um, and I think that this is mostly related uh, 
kind of everybody, even your classmates, your instructors, advisor, one way or another kind of assume that you are familiar with the US college uh, system and with the US way of living. And that's not necessarily true. And I would like to share very briefly, uh, uh, this is just one slide. So uh, basically how it's like this, I, I did that. It's not like official uh, statistics or not. Or not. This, this is just my, my experience. And if I will ask how familiar are students and people in Mexico with the US academic system, I will divide the country. This is a map of Mexico in three parts, in three sections or regions. And the first region, my green region is that uh, students or people that maybe are somewhat familiar with the U US system. And these people are, as I mentioned, for, for example, Sonora, another uh, border state like Coahuila, uh, Chihuahua, Tamaulipas, that one way or another, maybe they have family here or because they live in the border, they can easily cross and know uh, how how everything works here. So they may, may be somewhat familiar with that. Not necessarily, but maybe they are. My second section is the yellow one, that, that, that students that maybe have here one or two things about the US system. One or two things, maybe. And the rest of the country is my, my red section where I come from. <laughs> and they most likely never heard about it. Never, nothing, zero. So I, uh, I think this is important because it goes uh, by hand when, when uh, what uh, the previous panelists were mentioned that like know the students and uh, where they stand and I think uh, starting from that um, situation uh, where we can acknowledge I I, I want to uh, stop sharing uh, this that the students not necessarily uh, know. Um, anything really, particularly if they come from my yellow and, and red uh, region, I, I think will be uh, helpful because I think it's not just about the language. It, it's also everything. When you just first came here, there is, uh, you don't know uh, how to get a housing, for example, uh, how hire, the, how can I get electricity? How can I take the bus? How can I get a cell phone? How can I open a bank account? And those things is like go, goes a little like before it's, you start or in top maybe uh, you start thinking of the academic system that you don't know it. You start like, how am I going to survive here? So even if I think it's something so basic, uh, I feel that sometimes kind of um, our peers or even the, the professor like skip that part. They assume that that we know how everything works, the system uh, works and how the educational system works. So I think uh, uh, it's, it's something that it will be very uh, useful for us to hide in, in to account. And just uh, one more thing that I would like to share like about this, this misunderstanding um, that sometimes it may feel that Mexicans may look introverted maybe, or maybe unassertive or unprepared maybe uh, in the academic settings. But I think this is part of the cultural difference because in Mexico it's not encouraged so much that you defend your ideas or that you speak highly about yourself, about your ideas, about your accomplishment, because that is like brag bragging and we don't like bragging people. So it's like, you are not encouraged to do that. So I think in part of that, maybe um, Mexican, uh, Mexican students can, can look like, like a shy or maybe unprepared or apathic maybe, but it's not necessarily the case. Maybe it's a cultural thing. And another thing that, that has to do with this, that me, as Mexicans, um, we are very self-conscious about our speaking. Um, the other things that maybe we are inadequate because doesn't have like a very good English. So because of that, we prefer to be shy and not talk. So we could say that that improve, uh, no, sorry, not improve, worsens uh, the situation because if my culture tell me that I don't, get so much attention. In addition, I don't want to get so much attention because my speaking is no good. I, um, 
according to me. And I would like to share an experience about that. I like teaching. I, I was a teacher in, in Mexico. And when I came first came here, I, wa I, I wanted to continue being teaching and, things, uh, and basically everything that has to do with teaching. However, I was so self-conscious so self about my speaking and I feel I like cannot, I still are, that it took me like three years and a half to kind of overcome that and, and start to be more, more, more involved uh, uh, on that. And that is because I feel that I was inadequate about my, my speaking. So uh, I think is what I have right now. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity and for being here. Thank you, Alma. This was wonderful. And it's a good reminder always that the biggest uh, challenge all of us are facing are our often erroneous assumptions about others and the way we think about others based on maybe first impressions rather than to think of individuals think in a differentiated way um, and to really allow to build those relationships and learn about each other instead of acting upon assumptions. So thank you for sharing your perspectives. Um, our second panelist for today is Dr. Sandra Bernal, a lecturer both in the School of Architecture and in Religious Studies and Classics. And Dr. Bernal has experience in curriculum and faculty development, and we hope she'll share with us some thoughts on inclusive teaching practices. And uh, Sandra is also an HSI fellow, a Hispanic Serving Institution fellow for the current cohort of 2020 and 20. 2021. It's a lot of 20s in there. Thank you for being here, Sandra. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, start sharing my screen. So we are in the same page. Um, I have three topics for you today. And I would like to start by saying that, um, well, thank you to Dr. Alvarez and to, uh, Dr. Gemin for the invitation and also uh, well, I, I would like to, like to recognize that what I am about to share comes from a rich experience being in Tucson at the U of A, attending multiple courses at the Office of Instruction and Assessment, uh, having the opportunity of working in teaching teams in different colleges, and, um, see, I, and that was uh, since I, I was a student still. And for the last year, I've been working as well and, and learning a lot from a, a research and, and practical a, a work in the Office of Digital Learning. So that's, that's something. I have three topics for you today that I would like to not only share what I know, but also uh, share what I, I believe will be good advice. So the first one is approach the accent, the accents and the student diversity in classroom. Uh, the second is differentiated uh, instruction for the border, borderlands and beyond. And the third one is a successful teaching practices for UI instructors to develop meaningful learning spaces for the student and obviously with my experience as Mexican. So let's go and, and let's do the first one. Let's revise how we're doing in terms of approaching the accents in the first classroom. So first, accents refers to the pronunciation difference between between two participants, two or more participants in a conversation. And it is perceived mostly by the perspective of the group in power. So, so it could be anywhere. So obviously right now we are talking in the uh, US institution with Mexican students coming, but it could be actually in Mexico, within Mexico with other Mexicans and, and in different countries as well. The evaluation of this group of power is based normally in stereotypes. This is called bias. And yes, there is an accent bias based on, on these stereotypes, the stereotypes, and it could be conscious or unconscious. Uh, for those who have similar experience that I have, um, uh, I have with uh, unconscious bias and, and accent bias, is an, uh, this is an additional obstacle for the students and educators. And it happens not only in higher education, but also in K-12. So uh, what concerns me the most is what uh, the metrics are. So what are the metrics we, that, that come from these stereotypes, that come from this perspective of the uh, group in power? So normally the accent or the presence of accent can be measured if, whether this population is educated or not. 
whether it's wealthy or not. And that's very common in Central Mexico. We use that a lot. So to, to, to guess whether the accent comes from an educated level of society or not, and that's shameful, that happens. And you can also say whether it is successful or not. Sometimes we think that somebody is unsuccessful because they haven't grasped the adequate pronunciation of a new language, or whether it's intelligent or not. And this is just so a shame. It's, 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 uh, it's something that is really an obstacle for the learning environment. So my advice on how to approach the accent and the student diversity in classroom is to use a different set of, 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 uh, of uh, metrics. So I think, uh, well, first of all, you need to watch, or I advise you to watch for signs of desperation or tension in yourself in your teaching team and in your students. That's very important. So criticize yourself and say, I'm getting mad because I cannot understand and this student is just repeating and repeating the same mistake. But you need to be open to different a different set of metrics. So try to avoid the scenarios where conversations can become challenges for who is speaking, but also for who is listening. So and, and, and a very useful tool and that comes from the, the Quality Matters uh, uh, um, uh, framework, for example, is to line up your learning objectives in a way that the stress and the, and the uh, highlights are in a content. And everybody is well advised of what parts of the instruction and what parts of your instruction and your classroom environment are graded and what are not. Because sometimes we prepare and we know how to read. We probably don't know how to pronounce it, but we know how to read. And if you put a specific instruction on how to get a good grade in your class, we're gonna make it possible. We're gonna stop uh, dream, sleeping if we need to practice and practice what you wanna hear. But the, the teachers, we need to be very clear on those expectations. So using a different uh, uh, metric, set of metrics will be very, very useful because it's gonna relieve some stress from yourself. So for example, Expect that people have different, differential, different, different conversation skills, and that is not related to the language itself. Sometimes we are shy naturally, so our conversation skills are low even in our own language, and that's normal for any person, even the group in power. Time is spent in a new culture. So I am recently here, and probably my early experience in English is very limited, so you need to be aware of that. Casual conversations versus uh, 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 formal and academic conversations, for example, and so on. So how the different, so let's go to the next topic because the time is limited. So according to academic and, and uh, uh, my, my experience, how different, differentiated instruction looks like in the borderlands and beyond, and this is probably very familiar to all of you. And I have experience in both in institutions in Mexico and in here. Some professors use different word choice. Some of them use uh, what is uh, called a make them of, the, of themselves or try to mess up so the rest of the people feel fine messing up, which is a, a probably a, a good approach and sometimes help. Uh, stay strictly to the content regardless what is happening with the students and their, their way to interact or being super strict and, and just you know, react negatively and, and say that you are looking for the students to excel in all different fields. So that's something that, that also happens. My advice in that regard is to uh, take the ad advantages, look at the advantages of a differentiated instruction framework in a borderlands by uh, perhaps forcing the institution or forcing yourself and innovate strategies for student engagement and retention. Obviously that goes and that comes along with uh, taking the best advantage of your diverse group and open opportunity for internationalization. So what to do with all this information? So I'm gonna just try for you to imagine that your classroom is an environment, your classroom is a pod. It's a place when everybody uh, gets together and so right with the similar condition, it could be virtual or in person. And culture and the sum of cultural uh, human responses to the environment are culture, are, are what we know as culture. So what I will suggest is transform your classroom in a cultural pod by first Moderate some more conversation in the early, early uh, stages of your class, of your, of your semester, 
So you kind of sense and kind of uh, have a, a, a feeling of what it looks like and who will have pro troubles with accent, understanding, listening, and speaking. And then you, you're able to moderate your class. Focusing your, in, your, in, in the topics that will demonstrate the student knowledge and know the capacity of the students to speak well. So that's a big, big uh, help. And making it clear with the, the, the institutional tools like the syllabus, for example. Review your expected learning outcomes and make sure that the teaching team won't get issues differentiating knowledge with the speaking or accent issues. That will be very useful. And at the end, we'll keep open the communication avenues with the students so you can compare and contrast your different uh, opinions and, and interpretations. So there is a, and you can confirm mutual understanding. That will be what I will do and what I have been doing. Um, sorry for rushing. It was a limited time, but I wanted to share as much as possible. Thank you very much again for to the organizers and everybody in the audience. Thank you so much for sharing these slides and this model and vision of creating a more inclusive classroom and a cultural pod. Much appreciated. I'm sure we'll circle back to this soon in the Q&A. Um, so our third and last panelist for today is Dob Dr. Robert Cote, who, among many roles, uh, is the interim director of the Center for English and a Second Language. And we hope he'll share uh, some more thoughts with us of how instructors can successfully engage and support students from Mexico. So the mic is all yours. Please go ahead. Hey, thank you, Masha. So a lot of you may wonder how I got invited to this. Um, this is now my 26th year of, of teaching. And I started in Miami, which is one of the most multicultural cities in the country. And I've lived and worked all around the world. And when Nadia and Masha sent me the questions, I thought back to all of the things my students have told me over the years that they said, you know what, teacher or Robert or Mr. C or Dr. Cote, this is what really bugs me. And so I thought that would be a good place to start. So the first question I was asked was, what should UA instructors know and do to welcome and support undergraduate and graduate students from Mexico. So I thought about it and I would say to make Mexican students welcome, do your homework and educate yourselves about the super nation to our South. Mexico is a huge and very diverse country with many different local cultures and customs, even dialects and languages. And sometimes we make assumptions and we assume that well, all Mexicans are this or all Mexicans are that. And that's no more true than all Americans are this or all Americans are that. In fact, the more you get to know students as individuals, you'll see that our local Mexican, Mexican-American and US population who live here in the borderlands on both sides of the border actually have a lot more common with each other than Mexicans do with Mexicans in other parts of the country, which was alluded to at the beginning. For example, people from Mexico City may have a lot more in common with someone from New York City Okay, as opposed to someone from Tucson, which is more like Edmosillo or Phoenix. And someone from Cancun, which there are very few actual Mexicans who are from Cancun, would have more in common with someone from Miami. So we have so many assumptions that we just need to kind of look at an individual and get to know them. And so I would say that if you're a teacher or a TA or even a classmate, you know, your peers, view every student from Mexico as an individual, as you would from any other country, and just talk to them and ask them questions and learn more about who they are and where they're from. And I always tell people to, you know, actually ask them about their experience as a Mexican, both in Mexico, before they even got here, and then in the US. And you're going to find that every person has a different lived experience. And that's what you need to work on. Like Lisa said at the start, it's not all about course content and syllabi. It's about making a personal human connection. And I always say that you have to connect with someone's heart before you can connect and affect their mind. So that's so important. It's bringing the humanness to the classroom. Um, regarding support, I think this is so important. You have to refer students, all of your students, especially those who may be from another country and not know what's available to them, to places like the Think Tank and Cecil and the Writing Skills Improvement Program and the SALT Center and even CAPS. There's so many resources to help them get through this because it is not easy. Um, if you've never lived or worked abroad, then you probably can't even imagine, you know, what I'm, what I'm talking about. And I have lived in five, six different countries and it is very difficult. Um, I also strongly recommend that professors and graduate students who are from this country attend and present at conferences in your field in Mexico, 
There are so many. Why just limit yourself to US conferences, okay? A lot of the conferences are bilingual. You can choose to present in, in Spanish or English. Uh, in some cases, the conferences are English dominant. They want people to use the English language to present because it's lingua franca. So go to Mexico and experience their world. It's not always them coming this way, but you should go that way. I think it's the best way to connect with colleagues on the other side of the border and maybe start binational collaborations or just get a better understanding of, of who they are. I do want to add something um, to Sandra's piece on accent because I had written this before she mentioned it. It is so important that here, if you're a native speaker of English, you realize that someone's accent has no indication whatsoever or a reflection of their intelligence, their ability to study any major, to be successful in any field, okay? Don't let your bias about accents negatively affect your perception of your students or their abilities. And believe it or not, as a native speaker, I had to take accent reduction in my freshman year, 1986, at St. Louis University because I came from Rhode Island and had a very distinct Italian-American accent, and I was told, you sound stupid. And I was the only US-born student in that class. And I thought, this is really not right that they would categorize me as sounding stupid just because of the accent that I was born and raised with. And that was an English accent. So I can imagine coming with a foreign accent. The second question I was asked was how can um, instructors successfully gauge students in the language of their respective discipline? You have to get them to internalize the language by reading, writing, speaking, and becoming directly involved in their disciplines. It is so important because a lot of students get really tired of taking 10 years of ESL classes. Like they're sick of the grammar and the punctuation and the spelling and these irregular verbs. But if you start making them apply the language to class papers and projects and making PowerPoints and posters and submitting journal articles or just reading journal articles or submitting a, a, an application to a conference, they see how to apply the language and they start to get better and better at the language because now it has use for them. And this includes doing things like article and book reviews as well. And the editors will help them. You don't have to be fluent. Native speakers still get help with editors. So why not non-native? It's the same thing, right? What I do a lot with my students is I have them look at abstracts written in their field in English and ask them to edit it down 10, 20%. It's already been published, but let's make it better. Another thing they can do is to read a published article in English in their field, take notes on it, write an original abstract, and then compare their abstract to the one that was published to see how close they were. Did they get the gist of the article? And it makes them better writers, better readers. It's, it all goes together. Um, doing translation and transformation exercises are good, where you take, say, something in Spanish and just translate word for word into dirty English, like I like to call it, and then work on the dirty English document to make it sound like academic English. Conduct article and book reviews, because they count as a publication and it gives you access to reviewers for free. Um, I think it's important to attend conferences in your field, but it's even more important to apply to them. And even if you don't get accepted, it gives you good practice for creating titles and descriptions and abstracts. And I've even told students, you know what, if we're not gonna all go to this conference, I still want you to make a PowerPoint and a poster and let's do it in-house. We can do it in the class. We can have a presentation among our peers. It doesn't have to be in a public, a public conference. Um, if people don't feel confident enough to submit, then maybe they can volunteer to vet other people's submissions, especially to conferences, because they always have a call for that. And it gives you a good access to other people's language and see varieties of, of the language. The last question I was asked was, what would make for a linguistically responsive classroom? And you may not like my answer to this one, but this is what I have to say. I would say that as much as you want to practice your own Spanish, the, the classroom is not the place to do that, okay? Because the students are here for a reason. And part of that is to hear English spoken in a natural environment, because the more exposure they get, the better they get at it. And I've also seen bias in some classrooms where because the instructor spoke Spanish or French, they tended to speak to students who spoke that language in their L1. And it just didn't seem fair to the students in the class who maybe speak Hindi or Chinese or Arabic as an L1. And it showed actually a preference or a bias on the part of the professor. So I tell students in class, we're only gonna use English. Outside of class, we can you know, code switch, whatever, you, whatever you're comfortable with. Although many times I will re reply to them in English, even if they're asking the question in Spanish, because my Spanish is about the level of a fourth grader. And so I, you know, it's not exactly always, sometimes lost in translation. So I would say that's about all I have you know, to give for, for input. And then we can open it up to questions, because I'm sure there's many. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. Each of you has provided us with some really good and effective 
concrete teaching strategies uh, or strategies in building relationships as advisors and peers to international students, to Mexican students. Uh, so now it's time uh, for our audience to ask questions. Uh, and I invite you all to uh, post comments or questions in the chat, in the Q&A chat field, and or to use the raise your hand function and we will, uh, we will open your mic so you can ask questions. And I'd like to start with Patricia Hernandez because uh, I saw a hand raised there digitally a long time ago. So let me, um, let me give you, here we go. Welcome and thank you for wanting to ask a question or make a comment. Hi, um, my question is with international students for undergrad, do they just come for certain semesters or do they come for long periods of the whole, um, like their whole studies here? I mean, I can answer that. It depends on their level of English. So we have students who come to Cecil for up to one year before they're allowed to enter the University of Arizona as a degree seeking student. And then they go through a four year bachelor's program and then possibly a master's program and then possibly a PhD. There are the students and Nadia can talk more about this who just come for short term programs, you know, but they're not getting a degree conferred from the U of A. It's just to get an experience like a summer abroad or that kind of stuff. So it really depends. Yes, I can, I can add uh, very briefly information about it. We also have undergraduate students that since 2000, uh, seven, they're participating in the summer research program. It's a model that is pretty similar to those summer programs that we have for domestic students, minority students, women in STEM and other models on campus. Uh, so those students are students that their English proficiency is outstanding. And many of those students, all I will say 99% of those students are full sponsored by their home institutions. And they've been conducting research, not only in Mexico, but also maybe have previous experiences in other countries. Uh, many of these students, the 20%, uh, they decided to come back to the University of Arizona as a master and PhD student. One of the things that many times we don't have the information is the Mexican government offers different scholarships to Mexican citizens to come to countries such as United States. And they are here in a way not only to prepare their, themselves, but also for professors, uh, for staff members, and for our U of A community, those students are like the real bridge between the two countries because they know the higher education system in Mexico, they just start learning about the higher education here and their vision about the transnational by national borderland environment, it's so broader that many of them open uh, doors to faculty members here in the U of A to uh, nourish collaborations and research projects in Mexico and other part of Latin America. I think we have another question in the Q&A session. Masha, would you like to, to read that comment from Lenin Vasquez Toledo? Sure. Uh, the comment or question uh, says, I think that there's another complication, which is moving from the academic community in one's home country to the academic community in the US. Uh, Lenin writes, I'm a PhD student in philosophy. I was very lucky to be able to do that transition smoothly. That's not the case for many philosophy students in Mexico. Uh, I suppose something similar happening to people in other fields. I wanted to know if you have any thoughts about moving from one academic community to another. I do. I, I do have, I, if not an opinion, a good uh, similar experience because I do remember when I transitioned after 17 years already working as an architect and teaching at the School of Architecture in the uh, UNAM. Uh, when I came here, you suddenly do nothing. You suddenly do not know nothing and you suddenly are measured with a completely different set of standards that makes you nothing so and makes you doubt about your background and your learning and your experience because you suddenly what 
do, you don't understand is a system. And obviously that gets worse when you don't understand all the concepts and the language. My English at the time, it was an academic English taught in my high school. So it was very basic and I was, I was said that I have the keys to the world. <laughs> so, but no, no, suddenly you come here and you have a series of complications in, uh, in not only in, a, in the use of English per se, but understanding the system and it was said by Alma at the beginning. Um, yes, I was a transition like probably two, two terrible years of adapting and recognizing your own achievements back to yourself. So making an interpretation and a translation of what you have earned academically up to now and validate that with your own perspective, with the new language and the new culture. That's what happened to me. It was a terrible, but uh, at the same time, a very refreshing way to look at yourself and to go back, back engineer to your own experience and, and understand how you reflect with who you are, or who you were before and who you are now challenging. You talked about uh, the strength of one's own uh, background and identity. And we have another comment in the chat here that uh, continues that conversation, uh, saying we, we talk a lot about a sense of belonging. And we know from the scholarship a sense of belonging um, and developing an, an identity in a university, in a discipline, is a very uh, important ingredient to learning. But they're often it often comes with a sense that developing a sense of belonging means assimilating or conforming, right? Um, and you have stressed the, the power of and the strength that comes with uh, understanding the, the assets that our own background, our own identities bring to the table. So maybe uh, one or two of our panelists, if you would like to speak a little bit more about how you see that connection um, between the identities of, of our students from diverse backgrounds and the idea of developing a sense of belonging and how you would, um, how you would describe that dynamic to work. Oh, yeah, I didn't want to repeat myself, but yes, I want to jump in. <laughs> the um, experience or the lessons learned from that is that uh, at the end of the day, uh, you need to survive and you need to be resilient. So what you do is you create communities with those that suffer the same. So that's that's terrible to say, but it's true. So sometimes you just, just get along with the Chinese community students, because we all suffer of the same things. We all complain about the food the same way. We all complain about certain things that happen in the everyday life, but also uh, we also complain about the teaching experiences or the learning experiences in the same way, because we understand how frustrated are people by not getting what we try to say and what we try to do sometimes, how to organize, how to jump in and be the first one raising the hand to respond something like I'm doing right now, but uh, not having the right words to express what you want to express. And it's frustrated in both sides. So I, I believe that this creating these, these uh, communities of similar experiences, but also sim similar that we can come together and have similar responses. So there is a, a, a larger minority instead of a small little communities uh, of minorities there. So we belong to a big group and then we are more resilient. Also, I would like to, to add uh, to the conversation uh, that our panelists uh, highlight how diverse is Mexico. And there's so many misassumptions about those that we are coming here pursuing a higher education. Many times people think that, the, and I consider myself because I was a grad international student, that those that we are coming here, we are coming for upper class in Mexico. And that's not true. Our higher education system in Mexico, especially the, the public one, they have a lot of sources that they sponsor students to go abroad. Many of the students that I've been hosting through the research program, there are first generation, there are minority students in our country. Even we don't use those terms, 
and the way that we phrase or the way the way that we conceptualize those terms are different in our higher education system. So it is important also to consider that because when I was a student, I faced so many misassumptions about the way that I was here. The other thing is also because we are so diverse, many times there's uh, discourses uh, related with Mexican American, Latinx, and in our identity, we understand because it's part of navigating and learning about this system. And even we consider brothers and sisters because we are coming from the same heritage and maybe uh, those uh, students, their grandparents, great-grandparents were here before this region was uh, United States or maybe they were from Mexico. Our identity and the way that we see our country and the way that we define ourselves is very different. And one of the examples that I, I uh, face as a, as a mom, now that my, my, my oldest one is applying for, for the university, is terms like people of color. And I heard from many families mm -hmm. coming from Mexico that that term, when you translate it, uh, it's, it, it that doesn't have the same meaning because we don't have that term in our context. So I think it's also very important as Robert mentioned, that instructors and educators need to, to understand and to identify how diverse we are and not assume that all of us we identify with cer certain terms or certain discourse that are happening in the institutional level and inside the classrooms. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Before we get a question, I just wanted you know, to make a comment. I tell my students, and you never lose your original identity. And matter of fact, I want you to take on more identities. It's like a chess game. You're gonna learn the rules and play the game. And you may be you know, Mr. Physicist from 12 to two, but then at three o'clock, you're out there playing basketball with you know, the kids on the block. And that's fine because it's another identity. Embrace that. And uh, if we all became the same and homogenous, ugh. It would be horrible, really. It would just be awful. So I like having people with more diversity and more. I say, consider me like a bridge between your world of, let's say, Mexico and the world of American academia. And I'm going to help you navigate and cross the bridge. And sometimes you can run back to your side of the bridge and come to my side of the bridge. We go together. And it's like a game. They have to learn how to play the game to win. You know. I think there's a question now, yeah? There's a question uh, directed to you. You may have a good answer for it. Uh, you mentioned uh, connecting students from here to conferences and opportunities in Mexico and how instructors here might find out what opportunities there are to start building those bridges. Yeah, if you just do a search, you know, in Google, you can find lists of tons of international conferences in like every field possible, starting from today through the next like three or four years. and. I've done this with students and we just sit down on the computer together and say, all right, you're a biochemist. Let's start looking for some biochemistry conferences. Oh, look, I found one in Guatemala. I think you should apply for it. And many times they actually get accepted. Then they panic. Like, I didn't think this was going to happen. I don't have the funding. What am I going to do? I'm like, but you got your foot in the door. That's the important thing. You know, there's just, we just need to work better. I think on helping our students and our faculty find resources outside their comfort zone. Doesn't have to be within the 50 states. There's a big world out there. And the more international conferences you go to, the more people you meet who are from many different languages and, and cultures and country backgrounds. The US conferences tend to be too American dominant. So I, I haven't gone, I, I try to go to two conferences outside the country and one inside. So I'm more like on the outside, you know, because it's just it's just so important. If someone needs help, send me an email and I can help you find the different list of conferences that you can go to around the around the world. I'll just put my email there quickly. I have a follow-up advice on what Dr. Cott uh, uh, said. Um, if you join the list of, of uh, worldwide organizations, such as myself and, and the field of architecture and arid land resource science, I did join the Sustainable Development Goals listserv, and they send you those conferences. It's already filtered by them. So you know that what uh, you're going to get is it, it has certain profile and is closer to what you're looking for. And you will be amazed at how many conferences, call for purpose, call for research are in different countries and in different backgrounds. So 
most of them in English, and sometimes you need to do it in French or in Spanish, but it's again, it's a very multidisciplinary way to approach your own discipline. So go to the worldwide organizations. So I think that is a wonderful wrap up for today's session is the rule number one to better support those who may come to us from different places. Let us go out to different places and educate ourselves and build those bridges all together in both directions. Thank you all so much. Thank you to the panelists for sharing your time generously, for sharing your expertise, for letting us leave this session with lots of good ideas for concrete strategies we can pursue to create more inclusive classroom environments. Um, we would highly uh, welcome uh, the audience's feedback on the session. We have a little survey posted in the chat. It really just takes a minute uh, or less to uh, complete. We would love to have your feedback. And uh, thank you uh, if you have been here on Monday. Thank you for being here today. And uh, we have one more session in this series on Friday where we will focus specifically on what it means for Mexican students to develop a sense of belonging in a critical way. And uh, we look forward to uh, exploring some more of how instructors can support their students, how advisors can support their students in forming identities as Mexican wildcats. Thank you so much for attending this webinar series. Thank you for all who helped to make it great. And we're looking forward to continuing this conversation and this learning experience on Friday. Everyone be safe. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Gracias.